Welcome to the um, inaugural event for the LSE's International Inequalities Institute. We formally began business on May the 1st. This is actually the first of our events. We're going to have a very exciting package of activities, but this one, to kick us off, should be very special indeed. I'm Mike Savage. I'm one of the co-directors of the III, and I'm also head of the Department of Sociology here at the um, LSE. You'll have seen the programme. We're going to have a packed day. It's really a uh, great privilege, I think, to have Thomas Piketty with us for such a long period of time. That having been said, my first announcement is that his Eurostar is over an hour late. Um, so he won't be with us till after 11. But um, anyway, look, we do have a packed programme. And one of the things I, I need to say at the beginning is that uh, we're going to stick to time. We need to keep, stick to time. Um, because we wanted to keep the event free, we've had to um, have fairly small uh, breaks for coffee and lunch. Therefore, you know, we recognise you need, you need to find your own arrangements to get coffee and lunch. Please be prompt back. We will need be, to be starting on time in order to keep the overall schedule. OK, I will now introduce the first session. We're very uh, pleased to have Stuart Corbridge to say a few words about the inauguration of the uh, LSE's International Inequalities Institute. Stuart is provost of the LSE. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. A uh, very warm welcome to everybody. Uh, we're here, of course, to engage closely with uh, Thomas's magnum opus capital in the 21st century, but also to celebrate the official launch of the International Inequalities Institute here at the LSE. Uh, it started on the 1st of May. Uh, later on today, my colleague Julia Black is going to say something about the Institute and the funding that it's already begun to attract, but I've been asked to say something about its genesis. I'd also might like just to say a word or two more personally about the intellectual mission, as I understand it, of the Institute. Um, like most universities, LSE is organized around disciplines, it's around departments. We have 22 of them at the school. Um, including sociology, geography, economics, government. But about 20 to 25 years ago, the school embarked upon a process of institute formation and building, out of which we have some modern day departments at the school, the Gender Institute, as it's still called, the Department for International Development, Methodology, Social Psychology, um, and um, the European Institute. And this, I think, expresses the fact that some key issues in social science and of public policy don't always lend themselves to being studied within one department or one discipline. Under our new director, Craig Calhoun, LSE has begun another round of institute building here at the school. In the last couple of years, we have set up an Institute of Public Affairs, which is being led by Professor Connor Geerty, an Institute of Global Affairs led by Professor Eric Berglov, We've recently got a large amount of money to support a Marshall Institute for Philanthropy and Social Enterprise. And of course, we have the International Inequalities Institute. I do think all of these enterprises have a lot of support, but it would be fair to say that there's been a huge amount of faculty interest in and support for the institute that we launched officially on the 1st of May. I think this has brought together colleagues from across the school a wide range of disciplines. I, I look here and see colleagues from law, from international development, from economic history, as well as from the disciplines from which our co-leaders come, Sir John Hills from social policy and Mike Savage from sociology. And there's a huge amount of affection, of course, as well for John and Mike. They will be the first to say that the setting up of the institute at the school owes a lot to the work of many colleagues around LSE. Uh, but I need to say on behalf of those colleagues and the school that the Institute really wouldn't be here and would not be launched on the 1st of May were it not for the work of Mike and of John. These institutes will be addressing uh, the big public issues of the day and I think the reason why there's so much faculty support for this Institute is that the question of inequality looms large for all of us. I think it's significant too, and perhaps I can be a little bit more personal here, Mike, that Mike and John are perhaps best known for their work on the UK, but this is very much an international institute looking at 
inequality. And there's no better vehicle, I think, for exploring these themes than Thomas's book, Capital in the 21st Century, which has enormous temporal and spatial scope. You will be uh, examining that book and engaging with it closely during the course of the day. But I might just start with a quick uh, fragment or set of facts from Stephen Radley and Jeffrey Sachs, who in 1997 wrote, with but 14% of the world's population in 1820, Western Europe and four colonial offshoots of Great Britain, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the United States, had already achieved 25% of world income. By 1950, their income share had soared to around 56%, while their population hovered around 17%. Asia, which has essentially had two-thirds of the world's, world's population throughout this period of two centuries, had a meager 19% of world income in 1950, compared with 58% in 1820. Now, this clearly was the period of the great divergence that many economic historians, Ken Pomerantz and others, have written about extensively and that Thomas engages with in his book. People often talk about the third world, the tiers monde, being invented in the wake of the post-war, Cold War settlement, a first world and a second world and then a third world. But of course the third world was created, in fact, during the age of the expansion of Western capitalism and the regimes of empire, racism and social Darwinism that miserably accompanied it. I think one of the great texts on this for my money is Mike Davis's book, Late Victorian Holocausts. Happily, in a, in a very macro sense, since 1950, Asia has been slowly resuming its share of world income as compared to its population. We've seen reasonable stints, I think, of fairly inclusive growth at times in Southeast Asia, in China, even in India from about the middle of the 19, the early 1970s to the mid-1980s with the expansion of agrarian capitalism led by the Green Revolution. This very much worked to the advantage of the rural poor. Since the mid-80s, though, in India, many of the returns to growth have been captured by the urban elites. And we have seen a very slow reduction of poverty in India, largely in consequence of that. In fact, poverty reduces much less effectively in South Asia as compared to East Asia, a point that Tim Besley, who I can see here in the audience, has also written about extensively. I mention India, though, not just because of a personal or rather a domestic interest in this, but because one of the best contributions to the literature that I know, coming from 2005, was written by Abhijit Banerjee, who's a good friend of the school, and Thomas Piketty, when they wrote about top Indian incomes from 1922 to 2000. It is then, I think, a great pleasure to be with you today, both to honor John and Mike and their colleagues as we celebrate the official launch of the International Inequalities Institute, but also to say that this official launch follows on from a less official but still hugely welcome talk that was held last term and given by Professor Tony Atkinson, a centennial professor here at LSE. Today we'll be hearing from Thomas Piketty when he gets here on the Eurostar. And I'm very happy to announce that Thomas will be also uh, joining the school as a centennial professor. And this can be announced publicly today. That is great news. It's great news that we have the new institute. I wish you all a wonderful and engaging day. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart, um, for those uh, very generous and kind words. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to ask David Soskis to chair the first session. David Soskis, of course, will be known to all of you. He's one of the world's preeminent political economists. He's a professor of political, econ uh, political economy and, and, and government here at the LSE. David will introduce the speakers and the plan for the session. Right. Well, thank you very, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to do this in the following order. First of all, Bob Rothorn's going to talk, then I'll talk, and then 
Wendy will talk. So can I introduce, first of all, Bob Rothorn, who's uh, Emeritus Professor of Economics in Cambridge, probably one of the two or three leading left-wing economists of the past three or four decades, and we're extremely happy that you can, that you can come and talk. Thank you. Do, do you know how to get the slides working? So it's a, some, is it? I think that symbolizes the march of technology and the problems of age. <laughs> well, as, as you can see today, I'm talking about Thomas Piketty's Capital, and it's an appreciation and a critique, because I think it's a great book. So uh, I'm, I'm not, um, I shouldn't be taken as being critical of it. Ah. <laughs> Very good. I worked out how the arrows work. Well, the, the, key, the key concept in Piketty's capital is that of wealth. And wealth is defined as everything we own that can be sold on a market, net of all debts, value of current market prices. So, for example, shares, of, shares are my, uh, measured at their current price. Uh, houses are measured at their current price. It's not a real concept. In other words, it's not the number of houses or the, number of, the, the amount of real capital owned by companies. It's the market values of these things. And uh, this, I, this, I know this is a correct interpretation of Piketty because I took this off one of his slides on the internet. <laughs> it's word for word Piketty, so I, I cannot be accused of distorting him. And his, his first most important point is the wealth income ratio, which is indicates by beta, fell over the period 1910 to 1950. In other words, it's the ratio of the wealth that people own in, in aggregate compared to national income. And that um, fell sharply over the period 1910 to 1950, and it's increased since then, especially in Europe. And along with this has, got, has gone an increase in the share in national income of wealth owners. So the two things have gone together. There's been an increase in the ratio of wealth to income, and secondly, the, uh, the income share of wealth owners has gone, has gone up. And you can see this. This comes actually from Piketty and Zuckman, which is the, it's the same day per se to set as used for the book. And you can see that in the uh, period 1810 to 1910, uh, the ratio of wealth to national income was roughly 7 to 1, according to their measure. And it fell very sharply over the First World War and the Second World War down to 1950, where it's down to about 220. That's in Europe. And since then, it's risen sharply in Europe. Uh, the United States, on the other hand, was never as high, uh, and it didn't fall as sharply, and it's risen by less. So in a sense, that the really big change changes as far as Europe and America are concerned this is in Europe. And this shows the capital share in rich countries 75 to 2010. This takes this is taken from Piketty's book. Now, I've put the colours in myself to make it clearer. They, they, the original book is in black and white. And uh, okay. uh, as you can see there's an upward trend, although of course it's irregular in countries. For example, it's been flat in in Italy since 1995, the share of capital. Uh, it's been flat in France since, uh, since 1990. But there is a general upward movement in all the countries if you take the whole period. So these are two stylized facts, if you like. First of all, the, 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 the huge decrease in inequality of uh, in the wealth income ratio was re gradually reversed from 1950 onwards in America and it's sharply reversed in, in, uh, in Europe and the share of capital income has been rising. But Piketty's also got other things as well. Uh, the, uh, the other thing is the concentration of wealth. The concentration of wealth showed a big de decrease over the period 1910 to 1970. In other words, uh, wealth became more equally distributed, uh, but it remains very unequal, and it's becoming a bit more concentrated again, though not dramatically so. 
but the, the big thing was to change change over the period 1910 to 1970. And what Piketty asks is, are we returning to a 19th century style patrimonial society where you have a wealthy elite living on inherited wealth, plus a much bigger middle class than there was then on with modest inherited wealth? And middle class in this sense should be interpreted in the American sense, that it's a much wider concept than tradition used in Britain. And so, that, uh, so it's not that Piketty's, <coughs> Piketty's data and his arguments suggest that nothing would have changed, but it's just the fact that we are returning to a period of, with, of a relatively small number of very rich people. And the other thing it's worthwhile saying is there are people left out at the bottom altogether. And, uh, and another thing which is, which is interesting in his, in his work, which doesn't really connect directly with this, but is interesting in its own right, is that an increasing pro proportion of the share of, uh, the, of, the, of well, very well-paid people or rich people comes from labor income. And that's one of the, I find, one of the most surprising things in their work is that income from property, even though it's been rising in importance relative to national income, it's not the main driver of income inequality at the top. The main driver of income inequality at the top is, is top salaries. And it's, it's, it's partly superstars like football players and so on, which are relatively easy to explain because they're um, really an output of the internet age and, and the age of uh, television, global television and the like, because they've got much bigger audiences. But the uh, uh, more important quantitatively is the rise of the pay of super managers, top managers and the like. And that's more difficult to explain. And I'll talk about that later. And, and the thing here is from the United States, for example, this is, this is from Piketty's book, and it, it shows the, uh, the dependence upon labor income and property income at different levels of, um, of total income. So top incomes, people in the 90th percent to 95th percent of the, of, of, the, of the income distribution get nearly all their income from, from employment. And, and it goes down as, you, as they get richer and richer, or better and better off, higher and higher incomes. And you can see by the time you get to people who are in the top 0.01% 1, of the income distribution, uh, income from property is by far, the, or capital is by far the most important thing. And there's a, there's a, there's a funny curve at the bottom, and that's self-employment income, which has no, not been terribly important at the top level. And so, that, that's a very striking thing, really, is that it, it is the case that there are, there are very rich people who are living off, off primarily off, off their investment income, but uh, there are a lot of very well-paid people who are very well-off people who are living on their income from pay. And of course, it is, as we know, it's, it's also people like, in this country, it would be people like doctors and the like. It's not just the very top, top level. Well, let's, there are some queries of this. The first thing is I think Piketty's trends are very well documented. I know people have tried to knock down his data, and I'm sure you can quibble about some particular points. wouldn't be surprising, because all these long series of data have guesses in them. You have to assume certain things which you can't prove, but they're plausible. But I think that, by and large, it's well documented, and I think I would say personally I think it's reliable. There are some interpretations, however, about interpretation of causality. There are four questions I think of interesting. One is, why has the wealth income ratio beta risen, which I will talk about? Why has the share of wealth, income, wealth owners in national income increased, uh, what he calls the capital share alpha? Well, I'm not going to talk about that because it's rather technical. I've written on it, but I'm not going to talk about it. I was going to originally, and then I realized I'd never get off it. <laughs> the third thing is, what lies ahead for the wealth income ratio? Are we going towards a patrimonial society? And what has caused the huge rise in top salaries in some countries? Well, how does Piketty explain the change in the, the wealth income ratio? This slide, by the way, is a modified version of one. Again, I lifted off a lecture from P Piketty on the internet, so it's, again, a perfectly fair representation of his, <coughs> of his argument. It's the, the internet is a wonderful device, as long as you can use um, cut and paste. <laughs> <laughs> Especially as these days the quality of cut and paste is much higher than it used to be. <laughs> well, Piketty says in the long run, the ratio, the wealth income ratio of beta is equal to S over G. Is, S is the savings rate out of national income, uh, net of depreciation, and G is the economy's growth rate, which is, uh, in a sense, it's the underlying growth rate, which is determined by population and, in a sense, technical progress or mathematically productivity. And... Uh, 
He gives an example with S is 10% and G is 3%. The economy will stabilize with, with a beta of 300%. With S of 10% and G of 1.5%, which is a much lower G, your beta will stabilize at 600%. And he says capital is back, that is the wealth income ratio has risen, basically because low growth is back. Population and productivity growth have been very slow. Now, <coughs> this sounds plausible, but I, I don't think it's basically a correct argument for the present circumstances. It doesn't explain the last 40 years. I don't, it's, not in, it's, not, it's not incorrect under certain circumstances, but I think it doesn't explain what's happened over the last 40 years. Well, his, his argument essentially is that, it, that there's been the, an overt accumulation of real capital. The relative to the underlying growth rate of the economy, what's happened is that been that there's been too much savings. Too much, well, too much real investment. Now, an alternative story is that it's actually all driven by higher asset prices. The formula S over G, B2 equals S over G, uh, is based on the assumption that there are no changes in asset prices. It's, it's a so-called re real relationship. But in fact, asset prices have risen very sharply. And that, that is, of course, very important because you could take, for example, a, a, you, you own shares in a company and instantaneously the shares doubled in price. Well, that would double the, double the wealth income ratio if that was repeated across the economy instantly. And yet it would reflect no change at all in real terms. And your shares would not have increased in value because you saved more. They'd increased in value because of stock market prices. And it's the same with housing, that you can't make have the same house. So the wealth income ratio is, and is, not, uh, is, is not just a function of S over G. It also depends upon the pricing. And, the, and in fact, housing is, is very important. In fact, house prices are absolutely central because housing is now 60% of national wealth in, your, in the European countries he considers. And 40% 40, 40 so that's a typo. It's 40% in the United States. So it's 60% in Europe and 40% in the United States. And I've got a graph here which comes, some graphs to illustrate this. That, that if you take Piketty, it says Piketty and Zeiss, it's actually Piketty and Zuckman. Uh, that if you stimulate private wealth to national income in the absence of capital gains, you see that in the United States from about 1983 onwards, the, the ratio of private wealth to national income has fallen and it's been rather stable in Europe. So consequently, you could say that that, impl that implies that the entire change in the wealth income ratio is driven by capital gains or the, the changing price of assets. It's not driven by real savings or real investment. Real or real investment, that's the first point. The second thing is that it's basically a story about housing because this, this, this thing is taken from Piketty and Zuckman correctly reference this time. That, um, and what it shows is that housing has become, as a proportion of national wealth, has been increasing over, really over the, almost over the whole period in, in Europe uh, and also in the United States. But it's been increasing faster in, Euro faster in Europe. And you can now see that Europe is 60% is housing wealth. So if you, tell, if you were to tell a story about the wealth income ratio, you have to talk about housing in its own right. You can't just simply uh, put it in with other things. And, and the reason I say that is, is that, ha that, that the increase in housing wealth is, is not due to the fact there's been a gigantic am amount of bu house building and the increase in the housing stock relative to, popular, relative to national income. In fact, in real terms, I would imagine that the stock of housing in Europe relative to real income has fallen. That I mean, the, the real income of the UK has, has, has increased by several fold over the last 40 years, 50, well, 50 maybe years longer. But you wouldn't, the housing stock probably hasn't increased by that much. But certainly the big rise in the wealth income ratio has been driven by housing, and housing has been driven mainly by, by house price appreciation. And in fact, paradox is an inverse relationship. It may be because not enough housing wealth has been created in real terms that house prices, houses are short in short supply and the price is very high. So consequently, it's, the, it's in a sense the opposite of um, Piketty's argument. And you can see if you look at, the, this is from his book, by the way, almost all, almost all, the, all the things I use to, to contradict to Piketty uh, come from his own, own data sources. This is from his book, and you can see that the, 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 the pale shadow on the bottom right hand is the share of housing wealth in national, uh, compared to national income. And you can see that the upward shift in the wealth income ratio beta 
which is from about 1950 50, 50 onwards, is in fact driven by housing almost entirely. And that there hasn't been an increase in the wealth income ratio if you exclude housing in the UK. And this is the same for, um, for France and, and for Germany. I, I've got these things stored on the, my computer here. So consequently, my, my conclusion would be the following. That he says that, that the reason Peter's risen is, is over the accumulation of real capital, if you like, too much real investment, which is a good neoclassical explanation, which may be right under certain circumstances, but it doesn't apply to the last 50 years, 40, 50 years in, in Europe. An alternative story is higher asset prices, especially housing in Europe, and for richer people, other asset prices as well, stocks and shares and the like. So I think it's, it's essentially a story about asset prices and not a story about over-accumulation of capital. Now the question is, what, about, what, are, what is the future? Well, Piketty has another relationship in which he looks at R, which is the rate of return on capital, that the owners of capital get on their wealth, or the rate of return on wealth, and um, G, the growth rate of output. And if R is much higher than G, then wealth owners can enjoy high consumption whilst also accumulating wealth. So if you've got a very wealth, wealth uh, that, that's essentially his argument. Uh, although it's a somewhat slightly obscure the mathematics of the RG relationship, but basically it's saying that if R is much greater than G, wealth owners can, can carry on getting wealthy, they can carry on building the wealth income ratio up or maintaining at a high level whilst also enjoying high consumption out of wealth. Whereas if R is low, of course, then in fact if you want to maintain your wealth relative to national income or increase it, you have to save, save in fact, all, all your property income and indeed more. You have to rely on somebody else to save. That's essentially his argument. Now, he, no one can accuse Piketty of being um, unambitious. <laughs> this shows the rate of return on capital um, on a world level. <coughs> compared to the growth rate of world output since naught, the year naught to 1,000, <laughs> uh, to, up to, to up to the end of this, this century. <coughs> there is another graph that goes even further into the future. Oh. And, and as, as you can see, R was, was, was very high according to these measures in the 19th, 19th century and before, fell sharply, and is now recovering. As the growth rate of the world economy is picked up, peaking about now, and then it's going to fall away in the future. And the reason it's going to fall away in the future is because population growth on a world scale will fall. That's already happening for the working population in China. It'll happen in the, within a, 50 years, probably in India. And uh, productivity growth will decline because at the moment it's being kept up by the ability of poorer countries to catch up. So, so when he argues, if you look forward to the more distant future, the rate of return to capital will rise compared to the growth rate, and that will lead to a following. It will lead to a higher consumption for wealth owners and a higher wealth to income ratio. And this, this might mark a return to the 19th century, presumably on a global scale. Although what a return to the 19th century on a global scale would mean, I'm not sure. But nevertheless, that's, that's the basic the argument. So the argument is that, that what's going to drive the drive The, the wealth income ratio in the future is going to be the low growth rate of, popula of population and productivity leading to a grow rate, low growth of output. So essentially the, the, dri the driver behind Piketty's theory is partly uh, a slower growth rate of output due to these underlying factors like population and productivity, and secondly a, a bigger R because of lower taxes on capital. He doesn't follow that the rate of return on capital is going pre-tax is going to rise or has risen over the last few decades. What really matters is the fact that, that the profit on ta on profit, tax on profits has fallen. So high, higher post-tax profits and lower growth mean that you're going to get more inequality. Now, how do we evaluate this argument? Well, I think it gives food for thought. I think it's quite difficult to mathematize it in a growth model with clarity, which I have tried, but I think it's quite hard. But I think it does give food for thought. 
And it certainly applies, I think, to the people who are very wealthy. I think it's a quite a strong argument for saying that the, the very rich will be able to carry on getting rich, richer, and certainly they will maintain their wealth compared to national income, and they will also be able to enjoy a high level of consumption at the same time. So I think that it does this. For, for middle class, I think it's less important. I think housing and saving for retirement from pensions, which is, uh, is probably more important. And then intergeneration accumulation for the middle class is mainly through housing. So ha I, I think housing is, is, is a key issue, I think, in what's happened over the last 40 years, especially in this country, in, in, in wealth, as far as most people are concerned. And I would say the most disturbing thing is the loss, is the lack of access to housing in the bottom 30 to 40 percent of the population. I th and I think, that personally, I find that more important than, than that what's happening at the top. We should not just deny that, that what's happening at the top has certain, there are certain things to worry about. And th the last thing now is this business about super salaries. That, uh, in 2000, 2010, about 60 to 70 percent of individuals in the top 0.1 percent of the income hierarchy were managers, and that finance alone, managers interpreted widely to include people who get bonus, all people who get bonuses in banks at the top level, and so on. And how do you explain this? Well, one theory could be that the marginal productivity of managers has risen. In other words, top managers are producing a lot more value than they used to and it, they, they're far more important to production than they used to be. And Piketty is skeptical of this, because first of all, he says it's very difficult to, to measure what the, what the contribution of top managers is. And the second thing is that it varies a lot from country to country, and that, in fact, it's risen by much more in some countries than others. So I think they're very critical of the, he's very critical with his colleagues, in fact, because this, this argument comes from a thing he's done with Sias and Stanchevna. Sancheva. Uh, he's very critical, arguing that, um, that the productivity theory of managers doesn't explain why their salaries have risen so much in some countries and not in others. And uh, his argument essentially is that there's, there's, there's always been a large rent element in, for managers. There's been a large range of flexibility of the pay for top managers they could get. And, uh, and what he argues is that the reason that they're now paid a lot more is because they're taxed less. I mean, if you look at the hist if you look at the if you look at the evidence of what's happened, you can see this shows the average compensation of chief executive officers in 2006, and you can see that the countries that tax the highest have the lowest pre-tax pay for t chief executive officers. So, in other words. In the United States, for example, not only are CEOs paid a lot more, but they also tax much less. Now, his argument is that that's a causal relationship. It is, it's essentially it's causal in the sense that if, you, if managers pay less tax, they will bargain harder and spend more effort to bargain up their pay. So they will get a lot of the rents that previously they wouldn't, which were available, but previously they didn't used to get. Now, that's one possible argument that if you like, that, 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 and there's, there's other information on as well which he gives on top 1% of income, you can see that's also, is, there's a negative relationship. The lower the tax rate, the higher the pre-tax share of, of income of the top 1%. So his argument is that, that, that these things basically reflect the, the, the fact that tax rates are lower have caused pre-tax profits, pre-tax incomes, I'm sorry, to rise. So CEOs, top managers are getting more because they're bargaining harder, because they've got more incentive to bargain harder, because tax rates are lower. I personally don't find that a very convincing theory. I think an alternative theory is the same social forces and political forces that have led to um, lower tax rates have also led to a greater acceptance of higher pre-tax incomes. In other words, there's been a shift in social norms, if you like. And I think the shift in social norms basically comes from political power. And uh, so, in fact, that's why some countries still have much higher tax rates on top salaries and also have lower top salaries. So I would interpret his diagram, th that's this one, differently. I would interpret this by saying that, that 
that the, that the relationship, that the, 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 the inverse relationship between the tax rate and the pre-tax profit rate is not causal. It's the result of a third factor, a common factor. And the common factor is, is I would say, is the power essentially of organized labor in the society. And I think that's been the, the basic change that's occurred. This is my last point now. That I would say myself that, 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 that the, 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 there's, they have a common cause. And that may also reflect, of course, changes in the distribution of income towards capital. But who knows? So my conclusion would be that, oh, sorry, this is one last slide. This shows from an article by Foreman, shows the top 10% income share and the union membership rate. Well, that's quite a powerful in <laughs> inverse relationship. <laughs> I mean, it's good. <laughs> I mean, I must say. <laughs> It's, it's quite powerful. And this is a good lead into David Soskis, who I believe is going to talk about these things. So my conclusion about Piketty is that it's grand themes he deals with, and he's got brilliant data, and it's a thought-provoking analysis. But there are queries about some of his explanations, and the empirical support for the queries comes from his own data. Thank you very much. Um, okay, well, uh, I'm going to talk as a, as a political economist. Um, there's no question about the extraordinary achievement which Piketty has, uh, has constructed with this mapping out the development of wealth over two centuries, as well as the work on top incomes for a range of advanced economies, and using a stunningly simple economic model that the R greater than G model. Um, and I really want to broaden this out, and I want to question a bit the explanatory framework which Piketty is using. Or I want to put in perhaps an alternative explanatory framework. So Piketty really focuses on the, on the, on the rich, uh, both wealth and top incomes. And I want to look at income more generally than that. So I'm going to first look at Gini coefficients. And for those of you who, if uh, I, I guess Gini coefficients has almost become an as, as established, uh, established phrase for, 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 for modern social science, but just in case for people who don't know, the Gini coefficient is between 0 and 1. If, there's a, if the Gini coefficient is 0, it means there's perfect equality. If the zero Gini coefficient is one, it means there's perfect inequality. And I'm also going to focus on poverty. And I think one of the problems which I have had with the Piketty analysis uh, has been that there's been this, as I see it, really extraordinary focus on the top end of the distribution, and uh, in, in, in quite a lot of work which I've been doing has been, on, has been on poverty, and one is so struck by the rise in poverty over this long period of time that, uh, that I at least want to bring that back into the, uh, into, the, into the analysis. So I'm just going to, instead of taking two centuries, you'd be relieved to know, I'm just going to take the... Um, the second half of the 20th century and, and, uh, and up to the present, so the end of the Second World War to the present. Uh, and what is true in one form or another in almost all the advanced countries um, is this falling or low inequality uh, on actually on almost every measure of inequality from the end of the Second World War through to the mid, uh, mid 1970s, the Trente Glorieuses, as uh, Piketty and French people say. And then the progressive rise in inequality, uh, again on almost every measure from the, from the, through, from the 1980s through to the, through to the present. 
There are many qualifications, as it were, what I'm saying, is, which, I, which I won't make, but which you'll probably be able to supply. Here's a picture of the uh, American market income genie from the end of the Second World War to 1947 to 2009. Again, you can see how, it, how this goes, goes down uh, and then stabilizes, moves up slightly in the 1970s and then really takes, takes off. If you look at the United Kingdom, and I'm sort of more, I'm going to more concentrate on the UK and the, and the, and the, and, and the US than on, than on other countries be, because perhaps the developments there have been more dramatic. If you take the United Kingdom, this actually, I've started this off in 1980, and you can see the Gini coefficient is really remarkably low at 25 at that point. And it goes right up to 40. So this is, this is a, an incredible change in the distribution of income uh, across the income distribution. Now look at poverty. And again, I, I'm starting off in the end of the 1970s. So I'm starting off at the end of this period of relatively high equality and taking the data up to the up to the present and it's perhaps you can see in general poverty or this is poverty the the overall level here is the number of uh, the number of income uh, number of households below 60% uh, of the contemporary median. You can see that that measure increases very rapidly up to the 1990s, and then it then <coughs> comes down a bit but stays pretty high. What is really interesting is that the number of people between 60 and 50% remain rather stable throughout this period. The number of people below 50% rise really dramatically. And the number of people who are uh, below 40% of the median, this is, this is the relatively quite seriously poor, uh, poor households, they go from being just about 2.5% of, uh, <coughs> of, of the number of households in 1979. And they rise up we go up to 1992, they, they've, they've essentially quadrupled, and they stay, broadly speaking, at that level. Now, you may, uh, you may want to take a little bit of comfort, actually, in pol I'm going to come back to politics, but you may actually want to take a little bit of comfort in politics here, and you may want to think that New Labour uh, did something, as it certainly intended to do. It's, it's not going to be, a, I sh, I did, don't worry, it's not going to be a large part of my story, and it's certainly not direct in any way to where the future leadership of the, of the party may be trying to find a, find a route. But this basically says poverty rises really sharply through this period, and it's even more dramatic if we were to look at the United States. I haven't got, I haven't got that data, I'm not going to show that data here. Now, if I were to be critical of Piketty, uh, so, but, but so, let me just, just really, re, really emphasize what, what Bob said. I think we, we all think that this is, but Piketty is, uh, is, is, an, ama is an amazing achievement. But, uh, but what would we be doing here if we were simply saying Piketty is an amazing achievement? So, and in fact, because Piketty isn't here, it's actually even better for me to be able to <laughs> explain what my problems with Piketty are. Uh, so if he, if he asks you, you'll of course say, this is just pure, amazing <laughs> praise. <laughs> Piketty really makes too much of his simple R greater than G economic model in, uh, in, uh, in, in my view. It's really, and his explanation is really very purely based on that, that there's this Long th these 30, 30 years when, in, when, when you have growth uh, either greater than R or very close to R and wealth is, uh, and wealth is falling or stable, 
And then you've had this second period where R is greater than G's, very low level of growth, so that wealth is wealth, wealth on his definition is wealth to income ratio is, is rising. But that's all the explanation that he gives. Of course, there is a, there's a Marxism hint in the title of the book uh, and various phrases which come into the book that capital drugged by social democracy and the capital wakes up after the 1980s and it's democracy which gets, which gets drugged. But there isn't, a, there isn't any clear institutional analysis behind that. Um, so, my, because my interest is in overall income distribution and in poverty, the R greater than G model, which really just relates to the accumulation of, of wealth relative to income, is less, is less relevant. Uh, and much more relevant are just the overall data on earnings, market income, and redistribution, earnings after redistribution from the government via taxes and benefits, disposable income. And I want to try and sketch out a development which has been taking place over the, maybe over the last decade or so in, in comparative political economy uh, about what explains the, this, as it were, U-shaped curve as far as the Gini coefficient and poverty are concerned. Um, and this political economic approach pays attention to three factors which really don't come into the, at least into the sharp end of the Piketty analysis. The first is technology regimes. The second is labor market institutions, unions, collective bargaining, vocational training. And the third is politics. So this type of developing explanation, I would say, is anxiety about how you're going to receive these explanations. <laughs> the notion of a major change in the technology regime is the sort of underlying support of the type of approach which I think a number of political economists have been developing with the notion that you had, through the whole of the first 30 years, a Fordist regime where there was a huge demand for semi-skilled labor, uh, where you had strong unionization, it very much picks up the uh, end of Bob's uh, interpretation, strong unionization and collective bargaining coverage, and the consequence of semi-skilled workers being in a strong bargaining position meant uh, a lot of wage compression. And you see this actually, through, not, not just in the UK and the US, you actually see this uh, across Europe. And to, to look at the question of poverty, one argument which has been emerging has been uh, that, it's, that in the Fordist period, it was relatively simple to move people, particularly young males, from disadvantaged social and educational backgrounds into perfectly reasonable jobs in uh, car plants or wherever it, where, 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 wherever it was, where what was necessary were, were not great communication skills or high level of education, but the ability to do a certain range of techniques which demanded, uh, demanded physical capacity and also uh, organizational discipline. And that meant that the degree of poverty which we have at the moment, a lot of which comes from this real problem about moving people from disadvantaged backgrounds into, uh, into good employment, simply wasn't there over that period. So <coughs> with, you had this first period from 1945 to 1975 where you had a low market 
genie, relatively, uh, relative, I mean, I use the term relatively, relatively egalitarian distribution of income, and low market generated poverty. In other words, not poverty reduced by, by government, but actually reduced by the, by, by the market. And part of the argument I'm going to make, which is being made actually at the moment, is we've moved from a period where the labor market itself took care of a huge amount of the egalitarian problems of the economy to a new period where the labor market no longer does that and where instead of, as it were, looking to the labor market, this is the 1980s on, instead of looking to the labor market to produce more egalitarian outcomes, we now have to look to the political system, and the political system is not going to be very responsive to this, uh, to this demand. Just look at the political system first of all, and I'll make the contrast, uh, the contrast uh, in a minute. In a very, very, this is a very, this is a sort of very crude analysis which political science and political economists do. So if you're not a political scientist or a political economist, let me just apologize to you. It's like being a doctor and using all sorts of strange concepts which don't necessarily bear all that relationship to reality. Uh, <laughs> voters are arranged from left to right. Governments to win majoritarian elections have to capture median voters, voters in the middle of the, middle of the, middle of the range, decisive voters. Under Fordism, there were a huge number of semi-skilled workers, uh, manual workers, manual workers more generally. And at that time, both conservative and labor governments in the 50s, if we, if we, I'll, I'll focus on this country a little bit. Both conservative and labor governments in the 1950s support the welfare state strongly, support the industrial relations system and so on, and support redistribution. Because actually not very much redistribution is necessary at that point in, in quantitative terms. Now, we now move, we have the IT revolution. I really apologize for the sort of sim simple-minded way I'm do doing this. You know, the, the IT revolution, knowledge economy, globalization as knowledge competence distributed across a, a, advanced economies and so on, and now you have a massive decline of unionization, especially in the UK and the US. Uh, as the, there are all sorts of reasons for this. A huge increase in education, uh, increases work discretion among the educated, decline in collective bargaining coverage uh, as UK, US labor markets become mobile and competitive, and that leads to wage flexibility and fragmentation. So as we move away, as, as we take out, take, pull off the, this coverage of, un, of unions, we get to uh, labor markets which are much more, much more fragmented and much more uh, unequal. So labor markets are no longer the egalitarian force as, co as collective bargaining coverage collapses. Shouldn't democracy provide the answer by compensating for increased market inequality by increased redistribution being demanded by voters? Uh, alas, no, uh, especially in majoritarian US, UK policies. And now what's happened is we have a very different middle of the road majority, which is of uh, decisive voters. Both parties now competing for the median voter, for this middle class vote. And this middle class vote is hostile to unions and hostile to benefits because this middle class vote sees governments, if they want to increase benefits, as pushing up taxes on them and then transferring them to the, to the poor. So we moved to a, to a vet within the same political framework of institutions, we moved to a very different type of, uh, of outcome. And this is actually very, if I was to talk about Scandinavia and so on, I'd be talking about proportional representation, how that leads to different sorts of outcomes to, to here. Um, I'll, I'll just finish very, very quickly by, by the following uh, diagram, uh, which, now, what this shows is the, is the following. The blue, li blue lines on the, if you, let, let's look at, uh, look at the United States here. 
The blue line on the right-hand side is the Gini coefficient, right up here at uh, 0.45, very high, the Gini coefficient for total earnings in the economy. It doesn't include unearned, in it do doesn't include unearned income, uh, but it includes all, uh, all earned income, including uh, part-time work, flexible work, and, and so on, self-employment. <laughs> Forget about the middle column for a moment, but go to the left-hand column, and the left-hand column for each of these countries is the Gini coefficient for the number of people on full-time who are making full-time earnings. Now, what is very interesting about this, so this is going right up to the, actually right up to the mid-2000s. What happens in the Canada, the US, the G, uh, Great Britain, Israel, these countries, is that collective bargaining has pretty much collapsed. So the Gini coefficient for full-time workers who would have been the workers covered by collective bargaining, that's sort of not a million miles different. Here's where's, where's Britain. That's not a million miles different from, it's right up here, here, here. Uh, <coughs> To the, uh, to, to the Gini coefficient for all earnings. But when you go to the countries in Northern Europe, um, uh, um, in, uh, on the I must get my language about Europe up to, up, to, up to speed, on the continent of Northern Europe, when you go to Denmark, Sweden, Finland, Austria, Norway, Netherlands, and Germany, even though the overall Gini is a Re uh, relatively high, though they're, they're lower than the Anglo-Saxon countries, you can see that the genies for full-time workers, who are the workers who in these countries are still covered by collective bargaining, are very much, very much less. Sweden, or Sweden, it's incredibly low. It's, it's 20, uh, a, a, a genie of 20. So you can see that for all these countries, where you still have a high rate of collective bargaining coverage, 50, 60, up to 80 percent. In those countries, full-time workers who are covered by this uh, have a much, uh, a much higher degree uh, of equality in their, in their earnings. So uh, I'll stop at that point. It's a, I, it's a I, I think it's a depressing message. And the depressing message is we have, to, we have to rely on, all we've got to rely on is democracy in majoritarian countries. And democracy simply, voters are not prepared to deliver the equality which uh, one might very well think was necessary. Can I introduce Wendy, Wendy Carlin, um, who is professor of macroeconomics at, at, uh, at UCL and is super well known for her work on revising the economics curriculum. Wendy. Thank you. Right, so I want to start with uh, something that really picks up from the, uh, the end of David's talk. Uh, th this is a, a week ago in the New York Times, um, an article by Paul Krugman uh, talking about income inequality in the high income countries. And it's a, it's a pointer to thinking about both, not, not just the US but also the UK, and refers to work uh, being, being done uh, using the Luxembourg Income Survey. Okay, so the, the well-known fact is that the US and the UK are at the top for inequality of disposable income, uh, but that they're not exceptionally unequal in market incomes. And uh, what's new, so David had one angle on this, looking at full-time uh, Gini coefficients from the mid-2000s. These are the latest data, so uh, 2013, um, and a different way of, of cutting the cake, but uh, very striking that if you look at the population aged under 60, then market incomes are exceptionally unequal in the US and the UK. 
And this is very important for policy because it's uh, suggesting that we have to think about addressing. David was very pessimistic about this in some sense, saying, well, there's nothing that can be done about this. But uh, that, that may be too pessimistic. And I know Tony Atkinson will talk this afternoon and try to um, galvanize uh, the arguments in favor of what, what can be done. So uh, what I want to, to point towards is, is both the, the question of market inequality as well as redistribution. And here are the numbers. So this is the, this is the, the very latest data on genies for uh, the, the pale lines are for market incomes and the dark lines are for um, post tax and transfer. Okay, so you can see, see that the UK and the US are right at the top for both. But the, the differences across countries uh, really go right down the table. They're not that the, the US and the UK don't look very exceptional in these latest data. Then you look at what the story is for people aged under 60. And that's when the US and the UK look very exceptional in terms of the inequality of market incomes. So who's the, who's the other economy uh, the most extraordinary economy there, halfway down the table. Uh, so mid-table in terms of disposable income inequality, but it, uh, the most inegalitarian in market incomes, and that's Ireland. Okay, so I, I want to um, just uh, set out a, a rather simple framework for thinking about inequality or viewing the factors that play into those outcomes for inequality. Uh, and we can think of uh, the, the driving forces coming from technology, as David was pointing out in, in the historical perspective, but also from institutions and policy, institutions, policy, and politics, um, that these feed into that middle block, which uh, I, I think of as differences in endowments. So these are all the things that can affect an individual's capacity to earn market income. And you can think of that in a sort of very simple way as the split between owners and workers and the data that Bob was presenting. Um, and uh, that it refers to income from wages, financial assets, uh, housing rent, and, and royalties, for those of you who receive them, um, are in there. And that uh, we're then interested in the forces that lead directly from technology and from institutions and policy into post-tax and transfer incomes as well as the channel through the middle, uh, the middle chunk, which, was, which relates to endowments. Okay, so that just some, some kind of framing for the data that I presented. And we can talk about different kinds of policies as well as different, different um, underlying influences that end up as differences in inequality. And Piketty's focus is on the endowments that generate this income. Okay, so financial assets and housing rent, that, that, that kind of income. So his focus is very much on this, this middle block here, on what's happened to these differences in endowments as they relate to the, uh, the, the, the assets that generate um, income. Right, so uh, that I, why I'm doing this is really to raise the question of um, inequality of what? what what is it that we're really interested in and what are its effects? So how does inequality of wealth, which is the focus of Piketty's work, but also market income, disposable income, inequality of consumption, how does that affect uh, well-being now and in the future? And how is uh, inequality, uh, sorry, how is, how is well-being, right, as affected by all these different uh, dimensions of inequality, how is that affected by the intergenerational transmission of inequality, and how is it affected by the way that inequality itself affects the functioning of the economic system, right? So we can think of the, the channels coming out here of inequality, how do they feed into the reproduction of inequality in the future, and how do they influence that through their effect on the way the economy operates. So uh, just think, think of using this as some kind of frame for Piketty's work. Um, the first thing to acknowledge, as everyone has done, but it should be said again and again, 
uh, which is to pay tribute to Piketty, Atkinson and all their collaborators for generating the new knowledge which makes this, this discussion uh, a much richer one. So how does inequality of wealth measured by the beta that Bob talked about, defined as wealth over income, and by top incomes affect well-being? So we've seen that the, the rise in beta in the past 50 years is mainly due to capital gains and in Europe mainly to capital gains in housing. What's the effect of that on well-being? Okay, because surely that's what we should be interested in. What's the channel through which that increase in beta, driven by capital appreciation, <coughs> increase in the value of houses, how does that affect the distribution of well-being? And I think it's important to note here that that shift that uh, Bob showed very uh, clearly in Piketty's charts of, um, of the wealth income ratio, that increase is accounted for by housing wealth. And housing wealth is more equally distributed than the other forms of wealth. Okay, so it's a shift. It is a shift in inequality of material wealth, but it's a shift towards the kind that's more equally distributed than other forms of material wealth. Uh, if we're going to focus on intergenerational transmission, then the attention should be focused, uh, certainly in the UK, on access to housing and on housing supply as the mechanism through which that dimension of inequality can be addressed. But then the, 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 the next question I wanted to, to raise was how does inequality, as uh, generated by changes in this beta, the focus of Piketty's work, how does that affect the functioning of the economic system? To make that to kind of provide some context for that question, I think maybe it's interesting to give an example, not, not Piketty's argument, but an example of an argument that links a rise in inequality of income to economic performance, just so we can think about uh, this, this question in general. So if we think of the rising inequality and the decoupling of growth of median real wages from productivity, the fall in union bargaining, the rising skill premium that both uh, David and Bob have, have, have referred to. Then what was a consequence of this, uh, so an argument that's been made, is that this led policymakers to encourage banks to lend to low-income households. So that was, so a consequence of inequality was uh, an expansion of lending for housing. This produced rising financial fragility, vulnerability to a financial crisis, and a long-lasting re recession, as we've discussed on many other occasions. Uh, so that's one, one kind of argument, linking inequality to the functioning of the economy. Uh, let's focus on um, Piketty's argument. And I won't spend long on this because we're very close to being out of time. And uh, both Bob and David have referred to this, but it, it, I think it's perhaps just useful to come, come back to it in a slightly different way. So uh, we can think about this, that if, if the owners of capital get a net rate of return, this is the R, uh, on their investment that's bigger, that's higher than what's required to equip new workers with capital goods, that's G, then they benefit in two ways. From this, their wealth rises, so they benefit from the additional accumulation of capital. And as Bob pointed out, uh, this is a, a double uh, benefit for, for them. They can also consume more because they don't need to use so much of their savings for accumulation. So if the growth rate falls as it did from the, the 1970s, then as long as R doesn't fall too much, this process go goes into operation. As the economy gradually adjusts to the lower, lower uh, level required, uh, th the lower required investment, okay, with lower savings, and the economy remains in continuous full employment, then the necessary outcome of that process is a rise in inequality measured by the famous beta. So the big diagnosis is that a fall in growth, this is talking about what's happened in the past, but also a forecast, uh, leads to higher inequality. So does it work like this? Uh, if you want to, to think through this in more detail, you can look at David's very clear article in the uh, British Journal of Sociology Symposium on Piketty for more detail. 
So uh, let's think about it like this. What if, what if capitalists are firms or companies where the decision to invest is taken by managers, but the decision to save or the decisions to save are taken by individual owners and workers? Okay, that's probably not too unreasonable a way of thinking about the world. Okay, so that it's in businesses that decisions to invest are made and at an individual level that decisions to save are made. So if firms now invest less, right, because they're less confident about future growth, there's this fall in growth, but owners, and growth and growth ex expectations, but owners don't save less and therefore they don't consume more, so they don't take this double benefit. Then aggregate demand falls. The central bank cuts are, cuts the interest rate to boost consumption and housing investment because it's afraid of deflation. And the economy shifts to lower growth, but not higher inequality as measured by beta. There's no implication for beta in any of this story. So that's an alternative interpretation, uh, and it doesn't give you the R greater than G leading to higher beta as in the Piketty story. So this is consistent with some of the facts as we've seen. Um, so it's a, just a different way of thinking about the shift in growth from high growth in the 50s and 60s to a lower growth, but one that doesn't bring with, us, with it uh, this rising inequality of the kind that Piketty focuses on. So this is the R minus G inequality machine set within that broader context. These are the, the I think, uh, uh, a richer menu of mechanisms through which inequality has, has increased and which characterise a, a, a richer menu of policy um, uh, options or uh, policy interventions that can make a difference. So this is the Piketty R minus G route. This is where we should be looking if we're thinking about changes in workers' bargaining power, the CEO pay issue. Here we can see the, the role of redistribution policies. And here we can see the, uh, the relationship between technology and policy, uh, the questions about the skill premium, which will head down the top uh, line towards uh, economic inequality, where issues about um, the future role of robots and the relationship between robots and uh, creating well-paying jobs in what, what are sometimes called the labour-absorbing services. So with less than 30 seconds to go, um, let me say something about inequality, capital and economics. So. Uh, uh, a well-known macroeconomist, Ricardo Caballero, um, writing in 2010, urged macroeconomists to get into broad exploration role. Very nice title of his article in, in the Journal of Economic Perspectives, that it's time for us as macroeconomists to deal with the pretense of knowledge syndrome. Piketty's work really fills, fit, fits the bill uh, it's empirically based, assembling new data sets accessible to all researchers. And you've seen the way Bob has made use of this very rich data set um, to, to bring a critical lens to Piketty's own conclusions. <coughs> it's historically grounded. It's centered on the big questions. And this is the, the best of economics. Uh, this is where economics is, is headed. And uh, David mentioned this is uh, what we're trying to do as well for the teaching of economics and not just for economic students, but for other people who want to, to learn about how economists think of, about something like inequality. You can get this for free online and soon there'll be a, 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 a short video of a Tomar talking about his work in the context of how we're teaching about inequality. So the questions, 11.30, I don't think, Huh. Tomar is here yet. Okay, here are the questions. How does inequality measured by beta and by top incomes affect well-being across society now and in the future? 
and how does it affect the functioning of the capitalist economic system? So they're the, they're the questions. Um, you can you know jot them down and bring them back when uh, he's he's. Uh, I think he's up here this afternoon. So thank you very much.